Greetings, brethren, sistren, all those that hold true at heart the commandments of His Majesty, Earth's rightful ruler, Rastafari. And today we celebrate another leader, the birth of Marcus Mosiah Garvey on August 17th, 1887 in the parish of St. Anne, Jamaica, who shortly thereafter came to the United States and established himself in New York City as a leader of human rights. Earthwide, once said he was not interested in bringing every black to Africa, yet those that possess the will, the desire to build a civilization. His name will never be diminished from the books of history, so long as His Majesty says. This particular transcript was taken from his book, Selected Speeches and Writings of Marx Mosiah Garvey. Ross having read a few different accounts, a couple here, one presented by his wife, and the Rockefeller version of his story. I find this one to be the most useful. This speech in New York City, as I says, on the birthday of His Majesty, July 23rd, 1921. Right Honorable Members of the Executive Council, Members and Friends of the UNIA, I am pleased to be with you tonight. I desire to speak for a short while from the subject of leadership. That is, as far as that leadership relates to the great movement known as the UNIA, Black Liberation. And as that leadership affects the black race at large, you will realize as a serious group of people that you are living in a serious age, in a serious world, a world without sympathy, a world without charity, a world without love, a selfish, heartless world. This world in which we live is divided up into separate and distinct national groups. It is also divided up into great human groups. Each and every one of these national groups and each and every one of these many race groups is fighting for its own interests, fighting for those things that are dear to it. This conflict of groups and conflict of nations has called for the best in each group and the best in each nation. If you were to take a survey of humanity, if you were to take a survey of the world politically, you will find each little group of humanity striking out in its own domain, whether it be in England, France, Italy, the United States of America, or in Japan. Each and every one is striking out for its own protection. Let it be Ashkenazi Jew, let it be Anglo-Saxon, let it be Teuton, let it be Chinese or Japanese, each and every group is striking out in its own interest. Under the principle of self-interest, under the principle of national interest, the black liberation strikes out in behalf of the black, the world over, with an interest that is clear to each and every one. It has a national hope that is clear to each and every one of us. At this hour, Frenchmen are determined that there shall be a France, a nation second to none in the world. Englishmen are determined there shall be a Greater Britain, an empire second to none in the world. The Japanese are determined there shall be a Japan, an empire second to none in the world. The republic known as the United States of America, under whose flag of protection we live, is determined that America shall be the greatest republic in the world second to none. And a new hope seems to be springing up throughout the universe among the despised group of humanity that has been kept back for the last 300 years. The hope of a group is that there shall be an African Republic, second to none in the world. In the performance of these desires, the Anglo-Saxons of Great Britain present within their ranks the best of their statesmanship. They give us a David Lloyd George, they give us an Arthur Balfour. They give us an Earl Redding. 
we turn to the statementship of the great republic known as the United States of America, and they give us a Warren Harding, Charles Hughes, Leonard Wood, William Howard Taft, a William Randolph Hearst. We turn to the great empire and kingdom of Italy, and they give us an Orlando and a Marconi. We turn to the French Republic that desires to live forever, and they give us a Joffrey. They give us a Clementia. And we turn to this rising race of ours, and up to now we cannot discover a man. We have searched the world, 400 million of us, and we have not yet found the leaders worthy of leadership of a great race like the black race. When we come to match the statementship of the world, Englishmen are able to match their intellect to protect the interest of their government. To match the intellect of any other statementship representing any other government in the world, and simultaneously you will find other governments and other races able to present men capable of foresight, men capable of leading a race and nation to a greater destiny. Yet apparently it will appear that whenever fools are to be made, everybody turns to the black. The leadership of the past has been a leadership more destructive than constructive, a leadership that misrepresented the true desires, the true hopes of this struggling race of ours. At no time in history of creation has the black ever made up his mind to be a slave. At no time in the history of creation has the black ever made up his mind to be a serf or a peon. And at no time in the history of creation has the black ever made up his mind to take back place in onward march of humanity. And these things have happened.